welcome everybody per usual on a wonderful Sunday morning to It's All One Book with Rabbi and Friends. I am Rabbi Peter Gaines and uh, we are again joyful as we continue. You know, we start on the Sabbath on Saturday morning with a Totally Tasty Torah and we kind of segue into this meeting on Sunday morning where we take, uh, we continue the work in, in uh, where we are in Torah and then into uh, this week into the Haftarah, into the book of Jeremiah. And uh, it's very exciting. But in any case, um, one of the things that we always like to do, well, first of all, let's pray. Okay, <laughs> let's pray. Abba, we just come before you right now. We just lift you up and exalt you. Uh, any chance we have corporately to come before you and praise your name and uh, open your word and let your word through your Ruach, your Holy Spirit, pour into us, Lord. We just ask, Lord, that you do just that today. Inevitably, the more we study your word, the more we're prepared for the people who you purposefully put in our path with whom we are supposed to share Besara, good news. So we just lift you up and we thank you. Be with us today. Let your Ruach HaKodesh just pour over this entire meeting, Lord. And right now, uh, I just want to ask for your touch on our sister Sheila here, who uh, whose brother passed overnight in Stephen out in uh, California. And Lord, I just ask for your peace that passeth all understanding for our Sister Sheila and her husband, Charlie, and the family. Lord, uh, and again, as I mentioned to, to Sheila, that uh, she has done all she has done and, uh, and a, every effort that she has made in order to lead him in the right direction. And only God knows what his heart was at that time. So we just, Lord, we just ask that you've wrapped your arms around Stephen, Lord, and that he is at home with you. And again, we just ask for peace for the Rosenthal family, Lord. We just lift you up and we thank you. And we give you all glory and honor. In Yeshua's name, amen, amen, and amen. 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 All right. Uh, anything anybody would like to share with us? Uh, again, every time we gather, I always know that the Lord is working somehow, somewhere, some way. Whether it was a, you know, something that happened, some conversation you had, something that you saw. Okay, we had a wonderful day in the Lord yesterday in the synagogue at Beth Yeshua. And uh, is there anything that anybody would like to share with us this morning? I had a very unusual encounter yesterday. Amen. My sister Gloria had this masseuse who, who give, used to give her massages at home, who died. And she said this person went to the temple around her Kodesh and also to First Baptist. And she literally asked me if I would represent her at this funeral. I'm like, I don't know this person. But it, it was at the Baptist church near to me, which is like five minutes away. So I decided, okay, okay. So I went to the funeral. And then this missionary from, from Africa spoke about this girl. And this missionary's name, I remembered her from First Baptist. So I said, at the end of the funeral, I went to her, I said, are you from, did you go to First Baptist? She said, yes. I said, you don't remember me? We used to sit upstairs. She said, what's your name again? She said, of course. And the first thing she said to me, you know, she came from Tennessee. Her base is in Tennessee. She and her husband from Tennessee, they go all over Africa. So she said, you know, if it's one thing I would love to do now that I'm here, I've just came for the funeral, is to see Miss Gloria. Oh, I was, like, my. I was like, I don't believe this. So I'm telling her the story. She said, well, God wanted you to take me to see Gloria. So from the funeral, she said hi to the family and we went to see Gloria. Could you imagine that? What is this person's so, name? This person's name is Jeanette 
Jeanette she's wait 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 I'll, I'll, t I'll get my phone and i'll tell you what an incredible i was like i know so we went to see we went to see we went to see gloria she was so happy because she hasn't seen gloria in 10 years so oh, wow it was i'm telling you my paws right now they're still raising i said i came to this funeral I don't know anybody. I don't know the family. I don't know the person who died. I don't know anybody. And then, and then when, when she spoke, you know, they had friends speak. So when she went up to speak, the way she spoke, the pastor said, would you say a prayer to encourage or to invite anybody who doesn't have Jesus as their Lord and Savior? So she led, she led an, um, an altar call. It was unbelievable. Wow. Good for you, Lister, for taking the call and going for it. Amen. What, what could you mean going to have more, you? Importantly, how is Gloria? Gloria, um, the sister says that she was beginning to lose. I haven't seen her in a little while. She was beginning to to talk about, you know, what she's, why is she here so long? So I said, you know, I, the sister didn't share that with me before, but she was sharing it with this with the um missionary and so i said gloria you know what's wrong we, we we go to prayer meeting every wednesday you never say anything what's going on she said well sometimes i feel as if why am i living i said but glory you go with me to see my other friend this thursday she'll be celebrating 102 you know you haven't even reached nine tears yet what's wrong with you so we had a good visit though we had you know yeah but that was me yesterday Sheila, you know who she's talking about, right? Gloria and at the Gloria temple. Gloria Redmond. Gloria at uh, Beth Yeshua, the elderly woman who comes. Uh, uh, says yes. She can. She no, hasn't been there. Familiar. She hasn't sometimes been Sometimes I baby. Sometimes I babysit her at, at um, Temple Yeshua. Sometimes the sister drops her off, and I sort of babysit with her. Like when is her birthday, Alicia? Gloria. Yes. She, her birthday's in January. Oh. In, in January, yeah. Yeah. It'll come to me. Yes, yes. Okay. And Leslie, right? Gloria and yes, Leslie. Yes, Leslie was there. It was it was it was really nice. I'm like, you know, here am I going to a funeral for somebody I don't know. And this is why God sent me to that funeral. Amen. Amen. And who officiated at that funeral? Uh, a pastor Patterson. I don't know him. Never met him. Okay. Never. All right. met him. Anybody else? Michael, are you there? Excuse me, Mike. I am here. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, we like to see people's faces. If possible, it really is wonderful. Um, if if you can make that happen. Good morning, Miss Mary. We're glad you're okay. here. Okay. All right. Fantastic. All right. Again, we're uh, jumping, uh, kind of reiterating where we were yesterday morning uh, when we were studying Totally Tasty Torah at Beth Yeshua. And uh, Sunday morning is always part two as we move along. Uh, but we're in the book of Deuteronomy and uh, the, the beginning of the book of Deuteronomy, De Deuteronomy 1. And it's called Devarim, the words, the words, these are the words. And I like to refer to this whole thing as, uh, you know, when I, when I work with my students during the week, uh, inevitably when they're taking coursework or degree work with us, the last class, major class that they take is called the capstone. And the capstone class is a review of everything that's been done in the degree, all the coursework. That's the last class that they take before they uh, ultimately get their degree. And uh, this is the capstone. This is, <laughs> this is the capstone on, the, on Torah. So it's a review by Moses because Moses wants to make sure that everybody got it, okay? He, so he's reiterating everything that has taken place. And so again, it, only God knows that, that we need to hear what we hear week after week after week so that it can 
drill home in these stiff-necked people. Amen? Amen. So we're in Deuteronomy chapter 1. And again, uh, we just come before you and praise you and thank you. Pour into us through your Holy Spirit, Lord. We just lift you up and thank you. So uh, any questions before we get started with this? Okay, everybody has the, uh, Deuteronomy 1 in front of them. Again, this is a, kind of like a farewell discourse on the part of Moses here. Uh, ultimately, in 40 days, he's, he's not going to be with us. But um, Deuteronomy 1 uh, it starts with, These are the words which Moses spoke to all of Israel on this side of the Jordan in the wilderness. Last week, uh, the reading was Bamid Bar, which is Numbers, the end of Numbers, and concluded with a double portion called Matot and Masai. That was last week. But this week in Devarim, with the Torah portion, it's also called Devarim, or the words. And Moses retells the wilderness saga, the whole thing, and reviews to all the people everything that the Lord, that Adonai, had ordered them. And um, he begins with his directive at Horeb. Okay. Uh, Horeb has another name. What is it? What is Mount Horeb? Is that Zion? No, Zion, no. Sinai. Oh. Okay, Sinai. Hmm. Okay, where we had the giving of the of the law. Okay, and um, he, he uh, wants to have them get moving and take over the promised land which extends from the Mediterranean to the uh, Euphrates River, including the land of um, Ammon, Moab, and Edom. But essentially, the people who are there, they got to this point, they received the commandments, okay, and uh, they were no longer really in bondage. So kind of a lot of the feeling was, why do we need to go anywhere? Okay, well, let's just kind of hang out here for a while. Ultimately, nobody likes to receive change. Change is not always easy. It takes effort to cope with a new situation. But life, as you well know, all of you, is a journey, is it not? Mm -hmm. And we are not meant to stand still <clears throat> and to stagnate. Okay, we go through these passages of time. And if you think back on some of the things, I know that periodically in the course of remember, remembering certain events in your life, it seems like such ancient history, such ancient history. Susan and I have been married for 51 years. It is uh, amazing for us to think back and reflect on 51 years ago. I don't oh, she's laughing. I know all that has transpired in that period of time. Uh, you know, on, on the wedding itself, on the fact that uh, we had mega challenges because uh, certain members of the family were not terribly supportive about this union. But be that as it may, you, you remember back. He's being kind when he says terribly supportive. He's being kind. <laughs> they were horrible. <laughs> But we have forgiven. <laughs> but um, again, Hebrews 13, 17 says, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account and do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of great benefit to you. Amen. So it is here, ultimately, that Moses reminds this new generation that before the Israelites left Horeb, he had to create a system, uh, system of leaders to take charge of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties and tens. And it was not easy because of their quarrelsome nature. And it had been a really heavy burden. Do you remember the name? of the person who suggested to Moses that he do that? 
Yes, I do. Who's that, bud? That would be Jethro, his father-in-law. His father-in-law, better known as Yithro. Mm -hmm. Yithro, okay, who said he couldn't help but observe that Moses was going to burn himself out hearing all these cases. So he said, listen, you got to appoint some leaders and let them hear the cases. And if they can't handle it, then they'll bring it to you. Sound familiar? Yes? What's, what sounds familiar? The U.S. judicial is based upon it. Totally. <laughs> The, um, in Deuteronomy 20, uh, 121, it says, and they decided, you know, they were going to move on at that point. But he commissioned the judges and the cases and disputes and wanted to make sure that they were all going to be handled fairly without showing any kind of favoritism. But after this, ultimately, they moved on. And when they reached Hadesh Barnea, Moses told them, he said, Look, I don't know your God has placed a land before you. Go up and take possession as I don't know the God of your ancestors has told you. More importantly, don't be afraid and don't be dismayed. So when he, uh, well, I'm, I'm jumping ahead, but, but the idea of representative leadership seems to have taken hold here. And the people approached Moses asking the scouts to go ahead of them and find the best way into the land. And Moses appointed one man from every tribe. Each representative came back saying that the land was bountiful. However, mm -hmm. underline, underline, underline. 10 of those scouts said that the inhabitants of the land were bigger and stronger than they were. And the implication was that God was not big or strong enough or faithful or real enough to defeat them. Go figure. The implication was that, they, that God couldn't overcome all of this. The Israelites chose to believe the faithless majority instead of the faith-filled spies. Who were the ones that were faith-filled? Joshua and Caleb. Okay, so believing the majority report was contrary to everything that they had witnessed and experienced. God had moved powerfully and miraculously on their behalf, both in Egypt and in the desert. Okay. Everything that had happened, but short-term memory loss. Okay, unbelievable. Not only that, he had proven himself by going ahead of them, and charting the way that they should go. All they had to do was follow. That's all they had to do. Okay, humanity needs a follow, needs to be, need to be followers. Okay, everybody needs to plug into somebody and follow. Um, if you have a chosen profession at one point in your life, would it be a good idea to plug into somebody who was successful at that chosen profession? Uh, profession to watch what they do to see what kinds of things that they encounter there was no reason to think that god would bring them to the edge of the promised land only to desert them and leave them to their own devices <laughs> moses also reminds them that when their parents when their parents knew that they had sinned by listening to the 10 spies and understood the consequences of their sin they tried to make it right by fighting the enemy with their own strength. Okay, so remember, who's he talking to now? At this point in time, he's reiterating they're in the desert. Okay. But who's he talking to about crossing over into the promised land? Who, who was going to do that? That would be all the children who were 20 or less. Precisely, Michael. When they okay. came out of Egypt. Right. Everybody else, had, because of the 10 spies and the, the sins, and be, the Lord said, you know, if you, unless you're 20 years younger, 20 or younger, you're not going to cross in. 
Okay, everybody else is going to die in the wilderness. Okay, it's, it's like him. I keep referring back to the etch a sketch. Anybody remember etch a sketch? Yes. The thing that yeah. you're drawing, and then you lift up the plastic, and everything gets erased. Okay, God's starting all over again. Okay, so meanwhile, because they decided that, whoops, we made a mistake. They decided to go up into the uh, land into the and charge ahead, but they suffered a great defeat because the Lord didn't go before them. Okay, and anytime that happens, okay, nothing's going to happen right. In this parish, Moses reminds the new generation of the devastating consequences for their parents' lack of faith. The entire generation died in the desert. And so would he. Moses seems to be teaching that the majority doesn't always know what's best. <laughs> and sometimes following the majority can have unforeseen, tragic circumstances. And it really is, it is easy to get pulled along by the crowd. Okay, we see that over and over and over again. Yes. First thing that comes to mind is uh, the assault on the Capitol building, okay, that the former president has taken all the heat for, okay. Um, the crowd decided to move ahead by the instigation of a small few. A lot of people have political opinions. Lots of times your political opinion is based on how you were raised, you know, what your parents thought, not necessarily any kind of deep investigation you've done. Okay, um, if you if you spend a lot of time with your friends, then your friends uh, espouse certain political opinions. Okay, and more than likely, you would probably go along with that opinion. What should be, what should be the guideline when we make any kind of decision like that? There you go, Michael. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> Does it line up with the word of God? End of story. So we also understand that although God forgives us when we repent for not following him, we cannot escape the consequences of our actions. God will not desert us. But there will be changes that we have to live with and accept. In this parasha, Devarim, Moses is giving parting words, okay? Because in less than 40 days, he's going to die, okay? Moses will not be crossing the Jordan with the Israelites. Anybody remember how come? Why? Why isn't he going to cross the Jordan? Because he made himself equal to God. Okay, Shall but, we do this instead of giving the glory to God? Okay, so when he was when he was with the rock and but the, he, when he yeah, God told him to speak to the rock and he struck it. Exactly. And then he said, We will bring forth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Use the wrong pronoun. Yep. Does that sound familiar? Are we in a era right now where uh, people have to use the right pronoun? Uh -huh. Right. <laughs> OMG. Interesting. Oh my gosh. Okay. But there will be changes. Anyway, Moses won't cross the Jordan. He uh, takes this opportunity to point to the people <laughs> right on eye and impress on this new generation the importance of heeding his Adonai's instructions. So as they move forward, he wants them to be aware of their tendency to get in trouble. You think? Okay. You need to self-examine. You need to, you know, check with yourself. What's that song? Uh, just came to mind. Heal, uh, came and went through my head. <laughs> um, Anyway, it'll come back. See, you need to self-examine. You need to examine yourself and find out anything that's going on in your life that may not be pleasing to God. Amen? 
he, he wants you to be able to bear fruit. But the bottom line is this is not the end of the story. Yeshua will return to Israel when the third temple is built and there is a national turning toward him. As the prophet Zechariah foretells, Zechariah 12, 30, uh, 10 it is, I think. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me as the one that they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Amen. I mean, again, that's just a kind of a surface uh, commentary on all of Devarim, but he, he goes through every detail in the book I uh, recalls the whole wilderness journey. How many have a, a kind of a, a clear recollection of the book of Job? Yeah. Okay. When God shows up in Job, after all his, his friends keep saying, you did this and you must have done that. And that's why this is going on with you. Okay. But ultimately the Lord shows up and kind of explains it to his friends you do this, I did this. Were you able to do that? I did this. Okay, he makes it very clear to them who's in charge of this whole situation. Why did, uh, did Job get persecuted in the first place? Because Hasatan comes to him and says, you know, your servant Job, he's got all this wonderful stuff. He's a wealthy man. Da, 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 da. But if you took all of this away from him, he's not going to worship you. And in order to prove Hasatan wrong, he said, you can do anything you want to Job. Just don't kill him. And Job, to the hilt, completely supported the Lord. And despite all the horrific stuff, the loss of family, home, everything. Terrible physical persecution, boils, you name it. The Lord, he never said anything bad and only praised God. Even his wife said to him, what's wrong with you, old man? Curse God and die, she said. Woo! That was his wife. <laughs> wow. Speaking as a foolish woman. You think? So, uh, Uh, so again, he recalls this entire world wilderness journey. Um, and uh, he talks about they were sending the spies into the land and uh, how they felt when they came back. And uh, then he also talks about uh, the defeat of Sihon and Og, the kings. Okay, and he did all of that. And do, do you think that he did all that and brought them to this point in time so that they, so that they could um perish by coming up against the Amalekites or the Nephilim or the giants in the land. Okay, he sent them when he sent the spies into the land. Why do you think he sent them in in the first place? Do you think he did he send them in so that they'd come back and badmouth him? What did he tell them that this land was filled with? Fruit, milk, honey. Amen. He, he set aside. This essentially was their Garden of Eden. It was everything that they could possibly have. And he would give them the ability. I mean, when you think of Israel today, and you think of how they miraculously took desert and turned it into incredible fruit production, I think most of the, the best oranges in the world come out of Israel. Okay. Um, the most incredible flowers come out of Israel, let alone technology that has come out of Israel. You can thank Israel for your cell phone. Okay. So he's, he goes back and he reiterates all these things. Um, 
and how these kings came out against them and he defeated them. And he's reminding them of all of this. And if, in fact, you obey, then I am going to be your God. You will be my people. Amen. Do not fear him. I have handled handed him over to his people. And you, know, you will do to him. And you did to, as you did to King Sihon, king of the Amorites, who lived in Heshbon. Uh, I'm just looking for because they were talking about the size of the people who were there. Okay. Um, he's talking about the king, uh, King Og of Bashan survived the, the remnant of the Repha, uh, Rephaim. In fact, his bed was made of iron and it is not in uh, Rabbah or the Amorites, Ammonites, excuse me. The bed was nine cubits in length and four cubits it's width, according to the cubit of man. And so, as we were talking about in class yesterday, how big is a cubit? Sheila. Okay, a cubit is from the tip of your fingers to your elbow. Okay. Yeah, you and I know that that can be a variety of differences depending on the size of the person. But obviously, it's around 18 inches. So it says that the bed was nine cubits. If in if it was a foot, the book, the book would the bed would be nine feet long. How long is your bed? Six. Six feet in Six general. Seven. Okay, so this is 18 inches by nine. Hmm. So he had to be how big? Approximately, maybe 13 feet? 13, yeah. <laughs> okay. Can you imagine? I try to put that in perspective when I think about this new kid that was just drafted by the National Basketball Association who stands seven foot four. Wow. Seven foot four. They drafted him out of France. And... Um, uh, I mean, somebody you would think that that size, especially when he's only he's only uh, uh, 19 years old, uh, that he would be. I mean, put it this way in perspective. I I was six foot three by the time I was 12. I was fully grown at 12, but I kept tripping over my own feet. I was pathetically uncoordinated. Finally, I grew into that. Okay, and it became very proficient athlete, but seven foot four, can you imagine? Okay, at 19 years old, this guy is, is an amazing athlete already. He's playing with the San Antonio Spurs, but I can't wait to watch him in action. He's supposed to be, and I've heard him speak. He's very articulate, uh, nice guy. Anyway, um, Okay, so can you imagine being 13 feet tall? So do you, you, can you begin to relate to why the 10 spies thought there's just no way we're gonna beat these people? What were they missing? The Lord of hosts. Amen, amen. Complete faith and trust in him. And when we talk about that, Do you remember having challenges in your life whereby you got all twisted and paranoid and panicky about what, oh my gosh, what's going to happen now? And then what happened? Anybody? You're all sitting here. It miraculously worked out. Everything. Yeah. So, uh, again, he's in control. Half the time when we panic about anything, 
Okay, God hears our cry. He knows exactly what's going on with us every step of the way, the same way that he knows every hair on your on your head, everything about you. Okay. All right. So at the end of Parasha Devarim, I commanded Joshua at the time saying, your eyes have seen all that Adonai, your God, has done to these two kings. Adonai will do the same to all the kingdoms that you are about to cross into. You must not fear them, for it is Adonai, your God, who fights for you. And we cannot forget that. Okay, when he hears our cry, he's on the job. All the time. Any questions? Okay. Everybody's very quiet this morning. Okay. So, again, we were clarifying earlier. Uh, we're in a book of Jeremiah. Again, I know that you've been getting email from Mary regarding which lesson, but we missed a week. So we're in Jeremiah 7, called Personal. That's where we are. Okay, everybody on track there? Yes, Rebecca, you got it? I was just wondering if that's the one that I read. So that's well, why. Again, that's Mary, Mary probably sent you next week's. Oh, okay. So it was supposed to be this week, but we're a week behind. So I know that she ultimately sent you. Please check back in your email uh, for um, email from uh, Mary Sternberg regarding Jeremiah 7, verses 1 through 15. Jeremiah 7, 1 through 15. Again, this lesson is called Personal. And there is, in fact, a memory verse here. Okay, the subtitle on this section is that true worship is carried out only uh, through God, godly living. Godly living. And I know that's got to prompt all kinds of thoughts in your head. But the Lord kind of commissioned Jeremiah to speak to a people who were not in any way, shape, or form living godly lives. Amen? Do you think that might be a burden on Jeremiah? Doesn't he have a nickname? Yes, he oh, does. He cried, he cried so much for the people. The weeping prophet. Yep. Being prophet, he was weeping mm -hmm. for a couple of reasons. A, he was weeping because the people were so lost, and he was also weeping because, oh, woe is me! How am I gonna? How am I handling this? My gosh, can you imagine? The Lord had really put upon him an incredible task. Okay, so the the memory verse is Jeremiah seven twenty three. Go there with me. Anybody got it? 723. I've got it. Sir. But I explicitly commanded them, obey my voice and I will be your God to you and you will be my people. Walk in all the ways that I've commanded you that you may go, that it may go well with you. <laughs> Talk about shucking it down to the cop. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Obey my voice and I will be your God. You will be my people. Walk in all the ways. I command you. I commanded you so that things may go well with you. Okay. A lesson for all humanity. Again, Jeremiah is talking to Israelites. 
Is this just for the Israelites? All of this happened for the purposes and everything that we read about in Torah, HaTorah, okay, this whole story, quote unquote, is a Jewish story, but the whole commissioning of these Jewish people was to do what? Bottom line. Were they supposed to take everything that they got from the Lord and, and hide it under a bushel? What were they supposed to do with it? Share it. What? Share it. Share it. Precisely. Okay. As did who? As did who specifically went out and shared it specifically with Gentiles? The one formerly known as Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus. Rav Shaul, Rabbi Saul, okay, ultimately who had his name changed to Paul, Paul the Apostle. Okay, and took it to the Gentiles, much to the uh, displeasement of like Peter mm -hmm. and certain other people who said you can't do that because uh, these are uncircumcised people. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, ultimately and I can't help but refer back to that wonderful dream that Peter had. I believe it was in the book of Acts, where in the book of Acts, uh, he had this dream and uh, about a sheet that fell down from heaven. Mm -hmm. Right? Anybody remember what he saw? <coughs> so all sorts of things that the, the Gentiles ate and, and a voice told him, rise, kill and eat. He said, no, 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 I can't. Okay, so a lot of people think because the Lord said, you, uh, you can, you know, if I made it, you can eat it. Okay, uh, but what was in fact, if you read on subsequently after that, what was that dream about? People, not the animals. People, not animals. Okay, and unless the studying of scripture that you're studying and this is most people who don't who are not being correctly taught are thinking that the lord changed his mind about the dietary rules yeah he did not he didn't say okay now it's okay if i made pig you can eat pig mm -hmm. no way shape or form okay so uh again and what happened after that as a result of and how did the lord use him there he sent him to cornelius ah good lustra okay he sent him to the house of cornelius who was a centurion right mm -hmm. so and sent and cornelius asked to be baptized mm -hmm. and peter was overwhelmed and not only did he baptize Cornelius, but he baptized his entire, his household. entire household. Okay. A whole bunch of folks. All right. So as we read this section, I want to think about how God's message to the people through Jeremiah made a strong connection between worship and obedient living. Okay. A lot of a lot of connections here. So, can you imagine, like Jeremiah or like Jonah, who comes to mind? Okay, Jonah was commissioned by the Lord to go into where? That where great he, city, Nineveh. Nineveh. Okay, and he sent him to Nineveh because. Because he was about to execute judgment on that place. Yeah, because because they were living all clean, healthy lifestyles, right? <laughs> yeah, right. No, See, no. Quite the extreme. And and in his inevitable humanity, um, he said, I can't go there, okay? These people are pathetic, okay? And there's just no way that I'm going to be able to do anything there but 
on, on his journey there, what happened to him? <laughs> Wasn't he going the other direction? <laughs> he was going on a ship to Nineveh. Okay, and what happened? <clears throat> the, the ship encountered um, problematic weather conditions. Problematic weather Problematic. <laughs> That's a good one. Wait, well, let me write that down. Didn't see that one coming. Okay. <laughs> that, is, that is the, the new uh, LB translation. <laughs> That's the new translation. That's a good one. Weather problematic weather conditions. I love it. Are we not going through problematic weather conditions right now? Oh, my goodness. Please. We got to uh, get a different word for what we're going through. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, as a result of these problematic weather conditions, what happened? Well, they 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 they, they went to their garden to find out what is happening. And well, what uh, happened to the ship? It it was shipwrecked, and well, eventually. it was about to be. Oh, they, they cast them overboard. Yep. Okay, and they cast him overboard because they, they perceived that he might be the problem. But yeah, he, he told them to do that, yeah. yeah. And so uh, what happened to him then? He was swallowed by a, a whale. A whale? Well, I don't know if it was a whale, but it was a big fish. A big fish, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, and, uh, but fortunately, after spending how long in the fish? Three days and three nights. Can you imagine three days inside. Does that remind you of something else for three days? <laughs> yeah, Yeshua. The Lord is about numbers, is he not? Yeah. Okay, so three days in the fish, and the fish said, I can't handle this. And he spit <laughs> out. Amen. Okay. And he found himself in Nineveh. Mm -hmm. And so uh, against his best wishes, Okay, the Lord caused him to preach the gospel, to preach the, the Bessarah. The mm, good news. Good news. Mm -hmm. Lo and behold, what happened? <laughs> Shazam, they repented. Shazam. <laughs> <laughs> they had a bigger than Billy Graham revival. They had a revival indeed. <laughs> Teshuva came to town. Yep. Teshuva. That's right. From the top right. to the bottom. So, um, uh, again, the, the Lord knew and could do all of these things. And hence, uh, here we have Jeremiah trying to do the same thing. Okay, Jeremiah saying, Ooh, you know, why did you do the same way that Moses standing before the burning bush and, uh, and the Lord's telling him, you're going back to Egypt and talking to Pharaoh and telling him that you're going to release all these Israelites to me, mm -hmm. right. <laughs> ain't gonna happen. You got the wrong guy. I am. I stutter. I'm a wanted man in Egypt, and you're sending me back to talk to the king of the world. Okay, <laughs> I don't think this is very wise. Okay, but he wasn't God. Okay, God knew beyond a shadow of a doubt. Moses was the dude. Mm -hmm. to make that happen. Okay, so key doctrine here, the believer and social order. We should work to provide for the orphaned, for the needy, the abused, the aged, the helpless, and the sick. Okay, we are supposed to be doing that. All right, jump with me, please, to Exodus Genesis, Exodus, Exodus 22, 21 through 22. Who's got it? Got it. You must not mistreat any widow or orphan. If you mistreat them in any way, 
and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry. Amen. Okay, what do we say at the beginning? We were talking about people who cry out. Okay, uh, and when you cry out uh, to the Lord, he's going to hear that cry. Okay, and specifically, he's talking about the widows, the orphans, the strangers in the land, the infirmed, okay, uh, aged, helpless. Okay, he said, they're going to hear me and I will surely hear their cry. And if he hears their cry, what's he going to do? Sit back and go, oh, well, no. that's not our God. Okay, jump with me now to James, Yaakov, James 127. Hey, Rabbi, can you repeat that Exodus verse for me again, please? I need Exodus to 22, mm -hmm. Exodus 22, verses 22, 21 through 22. Okay, I appreciate it. Not a problem. Okay. James one twenty seven. Love to hear those pages turning. <laughs> there he is. If anything, okay, because keep in mind, most of us are using uh, TLV, okay, um, the Tree of Life version. It is laid out in the original order, okay, not necessarily like quote unquote Christian. Uh, NIV or King James or things like that, that that's in a different order. This is laid out in an order in which it most likely was written. Okay, whereas you have, there are three parts to scripture. Number one is the Torah, the first five books. Okay, and then you have, it's called the, the uh, uh, Tanakh. Okay, the Tanakh. T A N N A K is Torah, Nevaim, and Ketuvim. They are the three way, three sections of the book, the way it's laid out. Okay, the Torah, the first five books, the Nevaim, which is the writings, Psalms, Proverbs, okay, and um, and uh, the last part, the Judges, okay, is all written in that order. Um, so that's the way we, we have it here. Okay, but James 127. Can I add 26 for context? Sure. All right. If anyone thinks he's religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is futile. Pure and undefiled religion before our God and Father is this to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Whoa, keep oneself unstained by the world. What an easy thing to do. <laughs> in this day and age, how do we keep ourselves unstained by the world? I don't have to listen to the bad news. <laughs> Stay in the word. What did you say? Stay in the word. Uh -huh. yeah. Realize that we are, in fact, though we, it would appear we're in the minority, it's, it's kind of like, uh, who was it that said to his servant? <laughs> he said, there's more with us than are with them. Mm. If God would just open our eyes, we would see. That the hills are surrounded, chariots of fire. You you know, Rabbi, when I was growing up, my father never sent us to the movies. He would never give us money to go to the movies. He said the movies are a den of iniquity. And I thought this old man was so stupid. What's wrong with him? All my friends were going to the movies on a Sunday afternoon or whatever, and we couldn't go. And it's only now that I am older, I see, because I have grown up, I don't care for the movies. 
maybe if there's an autobiography going on or a, a historical or Christian movie, I'll go to see it. But you know, my friends, oh, they went to see this. It doesn't bother me at all, at all, at all. So we can live and not, we can have our children not like the things that the world likes, you know? You are not of this world. If you have now come into a relationship with Messiah Yeshua, you are not of this world. I, I, I don't want to get on a, uh, a tangent, Lister, with... Uh, We're all about tangents. With, no, I know, but uh, a tangent <laughs> about the movie that you were speaking about uh, with me. Mm -hmm. uh, but the other thing is that even the beautiful stories, the innocent stories, uh, the innocent books from our past have been changed, have been made into movies and they have become, I'm not gonna get into specifics, there's one that just came out in the movie theater last week, um, become so dark and so evil and so twisted, it just boggles my mind. It had nothing to do with the author's intention. So, you well, know, even the, even the good things have, have become dark and evil to attract the young people. Money. Yeah. Anyway, that's all I'm going to say about that. Yeah, unbelievable. I keep thinking about the, the movie Noah, the, the uh, Russell Russell uh, Russell Crow. Crow, yeah. Was it Russell Crow? Okay, Russell Crow. The his movie the uh, Noah. Years ago. Several years ago. <laughs> we even incorporated Transformers into that movie. <laughs> it boggled my mind. The Transformers were chasing after the Ark. <laughs> and there was nothing in that movie that resembled the book of uh, anything about the story of Noah, except what happened when they got off the Ark and, and they prayed after they got off the Ark uh, that the Lord said, go in and, and, and inhabit the world. and Multiply. Well, thank you. Whatever. It's, it's whatever. whatever. Yeah. Unbelievable. It is unbelievable. There are good things out there, i.e. the chosen, okay, which is quite extraordinary. And um, Sound, of Sound of Freedom, which just came out. Yes. Uh, I have to see uh, that. Yeah, uh, that is, uh, that's a must-see, uh, really, mm -hmm. really interesting done. And again, the person in, who plays the lead in that uh, is the person who played uh, Yeshua, in the Passion of the Christ. Oh. Yeah, Jim Caviezel. Mm-hmm. Very convincing. Okay, so... Um, is, it is it chosen still in the movie the theaters, or you have to rent a DVD? The no. Chosen. Yeah, no, you can see it. I mean, you can see it online on cable. Or you can see it online, okay. Yeah, yeah you can pull up the episodes there, or even on your phone. Okay. okay. Angel Studios. Angel, okay. Because I haven't seen it. Oh my gosh. No, I haven't hmm. seen it as yet. I'm going to see it. You are going to love it. Yeah, I'm going it's, to see it. It's fun. Anyway, um, so the thoughts here are that corporate worship, okay, when we come together at the synagogue or anybody as believers, you know, refers to the churches. Uh, but corporate worship is an important element as believers. But what about the rest of the week? How does the way we live the other days of the week reflect our worship on Shabbat, on the Sabbath? Okay, again, even there, the Sabbath is the most people, if you're church going, then it's on a Sunday. Most likely, but the Sabbath, according to scripture, is Friday night to Saturday night. Again, God's day is from sundown to sundown. It's the seventh day, which is Saturday, Friday night to Saturday night. Okay, so even the day that that happens, I mean, it's not critical. Any day is good to worship the Lord, but at the same time, um, we talk about obedience and he wants us to worship on the seventh day. Uh, that got turned around when um, Gentile believers who were worshiping with uh, Jewish believers, Israelites, 
and realized that the Israelites were revolting against Rome. And if in fact they worshiped together, the Gentiles were in danger of being killed. So he said, they said, we can't worship. We can't hang out with you guys anymore. Okay, we have to worship on another day. So they went and worshiped on the day that they worshiped the sun, God, Sunday. Okay, and so that's how that happened and ultimately got turned around. But a lot of things got turned around because people in the quote unquote churches were trying to do everything they could to pull away from anything that might be Jewish. And this is 1700 years of anti-Jewishness in the last 1700 years. Okay, again, uh, some of it in scripture is intentional. Some of it is just mistaken. But be that as it may, while it's important that believers gather to worship, religious activity can never substitute for obedient living. The expression of worship that God accepts are those that come from sincere, submissive hearts. And anything less than that is offensive to God. Okay? Think about that for a second. Let me ask you this. What would you include in a list of reasons people go to church or to synagogue? What makes participating in services more appealing to many people than, than to living according to God's word? People go to synagogue, go to church, okay? But then what makes participating in a church service more appealing to many people than than according to living to God's according to God's word. Is it the fellowship? Say again, Carly. Is it the fellowship of being with others? Okay. Um, so it's kind of like a social thing. Yes, like with most people, they look forward for that. To Sunday. Okay. That, yeah. Oh, it's one possibility. Well, I'm convinced that some people go there to be entertained, quite frankly. Entertained, okay. So they might pick a place that has a, a good worship team. Okay. okay. What else? Again, going to church or synagogue and makes is more appealing than living necessarily according to God's word. What do you think? But some people think they just have to show up at church or synagogue and they've, you know, they've kept the, the fourth commandment and that will guarantee them a place in heaven. That's all they have to do. <laughs> yeah, some people do think that. I think you're right about that. I think that a lot of times people think that, like you said, if they just go to church on that one day that they did everything, everything that they did during the week doesn't count. That's right. But like I was um, looking at a sermon yesterday and it was about um, the, the 10, um, the 10, what was it? The 10 uh, virgins. Mm -hmm. And they, the way they explained it was really funny. Well, not funny, but it was interesting because they were saying five of them Kept doing we're walking in the right way and the other five got you know like they got tired of waiting so while these five um kept worshiping and doing what they needed to do they fell asleep and the other ones fell asleep the other ones they they were explaining like they started doing things that were not of god so they didn't have the holy spirit in them the way they needed it but it's like during the whole week a lot of people will go and do so many things that are not godly and then come to church and be like, hallelujah, praise the Lord. I did it. I'm good. I'm saved. Once I'm saved, I'm always saved, you know, and then they, they feel like, well, I came here, so I'm blessed today and I am blessed. And then they go back and do the same thing that they were doing. They don't um keep that, um, what this, you know, they don't, they don't live by God's will. Let's put it that way. 
Yeah. Amen. Amen. It's actually the point, okay? Many think they'll live in the world for six days, and on the seventh day, they'll be absolved by all sin by just by attending a service. Remember, they have to go to, to confession first. And once the priest send you to say, you know, two Hail Marys or whatever he send you, you're fine. That's all you need. You don't need anything else. Amazing. Amazing how things get turned around and twisted. Okay. You know what? There's people in, in churches that like they do, they feel like they, they've been in church all their life and they feel like they're following God's word and they're doing everything, but they're being influenced by the things of the world and they might not be doing them exactly the way everyone else is doing it, but they're kind of participating. And that participation takes away from, from that, that grounding Holy Spirit that you have inside of you. You know what I mean? It kind of, it starts leaving little by little and you don't even know that it's leaving because you're shutting it down because you're starting to believe in uh, like like these movies, there's a lot of dark, oh, that's just the dark joke. And I like dark jokes. So that's just the dark this and I like dark that. Well, everything that's dark, it doesn't sound like it's very good. It doesn't sound like the light of God. So people get lost like that little by little and they don't realize it. Well, so they, they, they believe that, they're, oh, sorry. They believe that God is love. So God is not going to do any, you know, he's love. God is love, and that's all we have to keep believing. I could be the worst wretch out, but God is love. He's still going to take me, you know? So, you know, we don't answer the question, what are you doing with your shoe or what, you know? We really have to wake up. We really have to Sometimes I, when I have the opportunity to sit down with somebody maybe uh, that I haven't seen in a while or conceivably depending on the circumstance, if I meet somebody new uh if the lord gives me the boldness that i hope he would give me i might say to that person so what's the lord doing in your life people get stuck when you ask them that <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's the same way when i see somebody and maybe you know because so many people wear these big crosses around their neck okay and it, it and i say if I have the opportunity, tell me, yeah. that's really a lovely cross. I really like that. Uh, is that for, is it jewelry or is there some kind of spiritual commitment there? How do they take that? Well, uh, most of the time it's jewelry. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, so many people, again, wear a cross around their neck simply uh, because it's the thing to do. It's like going to church on Sunday. And as uh, everybody was just saying, you know, they think they can be do something horribly dark during the week, but it has nothing to do with the fact that I go to church on Sunday. You know, that if I go to church on Sunday, I'm cool. I'm and as, as Rebecca said, once saved, always saved. Wrong. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people believe that the cross is their protection. As long as they have a piece of jewelry with a cross, they're You're protected. right. What? You're right. They You're do that. feel that. They're not only do they feel that, they feel like, well, that little cross, even if I do something wrong, I kiss it and he forgave Everything me. Everything is all right. Yeah. Yeah. He forgave me. And mm -hmm. that's right. And so there's no further obedience, no sense of taking on the responsibility of what goes with that cross. Amen. So, yeah, I mean. You know, I, I wear a cross. And the, and the one reason where, why I wear a cross, I remember when my mother died, my aunt was the first person who gave me a Bible. Okay. And when she died, her half sister sent me a cross she had with a diamond in the middle of it and that reminds me of my aunt and the fact that she gave me my first bible and in that bible she wrote she wrote may the precepts of this book be your guide through life wow. mm. that was great 
And I never forgot that. And then too, when I started to go to the temple around her Kodesh, my daughter gave me a star of David. So I combined the, the, the cross with the star. And that I remember every day. I remember, yes, that's what I do. That's how, that's what I wear. And, <laughs> and it's not for jewelry. It, 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 you know, and sometimes I'm so sorry. I gave that Bible away when I bought a new Bible to somebody who didn't have a Bible. I said, oh, I should have always kept that Bible. But you know, what's done is it's done. But the word of God, I love the word of God. I wish I had spent more time studying and memorizing and putting it in more in my heart. But I love the word of God. It has really guided me, still guided me because when I mess up, oh my gosh, I know Lord, you know, I wasn't following what the word says. So what this, this particular thing that I wear was a gift from my wife when I first came to faith. Wow. That was beautiful. So, uh, never comes off. But be that as it may, um, it, it serves the same way that the mezuzah on the doorpost of my house mm -hmm. serves as a reminder. It's a reminder, yeah. Reminder. Okay, the same way that the Lord said, put this thing on your head. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, anyway, let's, let's uh, jump into this thing here. Okay, God called Jeremiah to stand at the gate of the Lord's house to preach to the people. And Jeremiah warned God's people not to trust in empty words, but in faithful action. It did no good for them to proclaim God's salvation in his house on holy days. And if they were just going to ignore him the rest of the time. God warned that he would make Jerusalem just like Shiloh. Anybody know what Shiloh is without me? Uh... You first seen that word before? Shiloh, S H I S H I L O H, Shiloh. Know what it is? You would make Jerusalem just like Shiloh. To, for time purposes, Shiloh is a former Israelite worship center. It had been utterly and completely destroyed. Oh. Okay. The Lord also instructed Jeremiah not to pray for the people. He wanted his people to demonstrate faith through obedience. We know that obedience is better than sacrifice. Nobody knows that. But they had not. And the Lord denounced Judah's wickedness and warned a great day of judgment and slaughter was coming. The Lord lamented that his people continued to turn away. And Judah's leaders who falsely promised uh, peace would experience his wrath. Jeremiah confessed ultimately that his personal sorrow as he anticipated Judah's coming exile, the weeping prophet. Okay, in fact, he actually wept over his people. The Lord promised even more mourning, M-O-U-R-N, as Judah's cities would become desolate. Jeremiah wondered if anyone was wise enough to understand the reason for their calamity. Okay, again, I look around, and all I see is Matthew 24. What do I mean? When I, Deception. Going, when I see what's going on in the world right now, what do I think of? Why, why Matthew 24? What does that say? It speaks of a time of great deception. That's the end of the time. That's what's going to happen in the end days. Is it destruction all, of the time? All time? these things about, calling what? Is it destruction and signs of the temple? Destruction? No, yeah. what's going to happen? In yeah, is when you look around and we see all these things, all the, the incredible violence that's going on, which seems to be getting worse, that what is right is wrong and what is wrong is right. Okay, uh, our, our political leaders have things completely upside down and backwards. 
okay, um, and that uh, you know if, the, even even the weather, okay, um, that all of this are according to Matthew twenty four the birth are pangs birth pangs of what ultimately is going to happen. Okay, people turning against people, people sacrificing their children. There was a woman in the news last week who hired a hitman to kill her three-year-old child. Mm. What? That's insane. Yep, it is insane. Jeremiah contrasted false gods with the one true God. People worship worthless idols while the Lord reigned as king of the nations, no idol could compare. Judah's foolishness would end soon, though no idol would, uh, would uh, excuse me, though, because God would show himself supreme over all. Jeremiah experienced great mental anguish because the people did not listen to him. Sound familiar? He asked the Lord to keep him faithful even as God judged those nations that opposed him. Somebody read for me verses 1 and 2. This is chapter 7, Jeremiah, verse 1 and 2. Hang on one second. We have a guest. Okay. Welcome, Miss Kalita. Seen Kalita in a while. Miss Kalita, welcome. I'm sorry. Hey. Thanks. It's been a while. Yeah. Okay. You doing okay? A little frustrated. Could use some prayer. We'll we'll get to it. Yeah. All right. Get mm -hmm. to that for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Someone was about to read. We're in Jeremiah 7 verses 1 and 2. Who's got it? Okay. I have it. Yes. Go ahead. The word that came to Jeremiah from Adonai saying, stand in the gate of Adonai's house and proclaim there his word and say, Hear the word of Adonai, all you of Judah that, that come through these gates to worship Adonai. Amen. So the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, okay, that, that credibility right there, provide an important introduction. The message that Jeremiah spoke came from God and not from him himself. And a lot of uh, interpreters note that the close parallels with Jeremiah 26, which is dated uh, toward the beginning of evil King jo Joachim, Joachim uh, around 609 BC. Others believe that chapters describe similar but distinct events. But God instructed Jeremiah specifically to stand at the gate of God's house, the temple. Jerusalem lay close to Judah's northern border. So most people would enter the temple area would have entered from the south. Consequently, Many interpreters believe Jeremiah was standing at the temple's southern entrance. The command, call out this word, indicates that Jeremiah was to preach loudly and publicly. The prophet would invite all to hear the word of the Lord. The word translated here implies obedience. It is key. Okay, Jeremiah would make sure that everyone heard God's words but individuals were responsible to obey. And the rest of the verse identifies Jeremiah's audience, anyone who came to worship the Lord. God's concern extended to all his people, not merely the leaders. The Judeans had come through these gates to honor God, which normally would have been a good thing. However, God challenged them to understand and practice the true meaning of worship. And the deal is here that believers need to listen to God's message, but we also must act on what he says as his spirit guides us. Okay, so it, again, it's not just a matter of going to church on Sunday. Okay, to be seen or to think that anything you did in the course of the week is going to be absolved by you simply attending a church service. Okay, he says his spirit guides us, God's message may come through our worship in singing, in corporate prayer, or in preaching. Regardless, God wants us to not only hear his words, but also apply it to our lives. 
for his glory. Amen. Amen. So that being the case, what is the significance of God's telling Jeremiah to deliver the message to the people as they were entering the gates of the temple to worship? In other words, what's the difference between simply hearing a person and listening to a person? Big difference between hearing and listening. Kind of like when you're watching a movie and you um, hear the dialogue, but if you're really listening, then you um, get into the story. You it, it makes it personal for you. Difference between hearing and listening. Communication requires... Miriam two things. Finds hearing as the process. Requires two things. It requires the sender and the receiver. Okay, it has to be a joint effort. Okay, but if the message, if part of that is missing, then there's no communication. Sure. Okay, hearing is noise. Mm -hmm. You can hear you know, the trucks in the street or the birds in the sky, okay, or the jets going overhead, or and generally those are just things that you hear, some things you just take for granted. Okay, we live on a flight path over here. Okay, I hear those kinds of things all the time. Okay, I wonder if one of those planes is going to come through my window. It's not that bad. I'm just kidding. But and then behind us, not very far away, is a train track. Mm -hmm. Right line comes whipping through at 80 miles an hour, at least. Okay, it used to be that when those trains came through over there, that we'd always hear the whistle, the train whistle as they crossed the, 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 uh, the street. Okay, they stopped doing that. But they, but again, those are things that you just hear and sometimes take for granted. But listening is something else. Listening means absorbing what you're hearing. Mm -hmm. Is that you, like is that like interpreting the sound? Listening. Well, it's a question of absorbing everything that's being oh, spoken. Okay. To you, okay. Uh, again. I'm thinking of a multitude of things. Uh, there are several occasions when I have audibly heard God's voice. Mm. Okay, audibly heard a voice. Fortunately, I heard it. <laughs> okay. Because otherwise I wouldn't have been sitting here on a couple of those occasions. All right. One was during uh, an approaching hurricane when the Lord told me, get out of where you are. And three hours later, the windows came in. Right. Okay, so the other time in particular was I was living in California, making, uh, working as a studio musician in California. Hang on one second, please. Um, so um, the other thing is when you said, I need for you to wear that thing on your head. Now you're talking about musician in California. Uh, when I was living in California, the Lord said, get thee from this place. Mm. I had literally abandoned going to seminary and being accepted there for a record contract. Mm. Figuring, oh, I'll go make a million dollars and then I'll go back to seminary. Mm. Me, very unhappy. <laughs> Okay, and he made no bones about making it very clear to me uh, that I was not where he wanted me to be in in La California. <laughs> okay, um, but again, believers need to listen to the message. You have to act on what he says. Okay, uh, so um, again. We have to be constantly attuned to where he's, to, I mean, he speaks to us all day long, every day. We have to exercise that discernment and think about, you know, what's going on in our lives and what is the message that he's trying to tell us all the time, all the time. We are children of a living God. Amen. Amen. All right. So uh, read verse three for me, Sheila, please. Okay. So, <clears throat> to say in verse three, 
so tiny. Seven three. Uh, seven three, right. Uh, I don't see the number. Why don't I see the number? Okay, I'm going to go and say, hear the word about Anoy, all you of Judah that come through these gates. Hey, to chapter, 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 Thus says, that, that, thus says, yeah, that, that's how I found it. Thus says Adonai Sivaot, the God of Israel, mend your ways and your deeds, and I will let you live in this place. Do not trust right. them. Oh, oh, that's it. it. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> His opening words right there stress Jeremiah's messenger role, but they also emphasize one aspect of God's character the Lord of armies. Adonai Tzavaot, okay, it signifies God's control of heavenly forces and his sovereign power over all creation. Adonai Tzavaot, okay, the Lord of heaven's armies. You don't think of heaven as necessarily a place where you would need an army. Mm. But were there battles fought there? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, and what may have happened? Satan was kicked into the earth, he and his minions. Oh. Yep. Okay. Uh, God of Judah, northern kingdom of Israel had fallen to Assyria. However, the Bible tells us that some people in the north turned back to God after Israel fell. So Jeremiah could have included them by designation. God issued a challenge. He said, correct your ways and your actions. And the people, uh, the way that people lived did not match their profession of faith. What were we just talking about? Okay. Going to church on Sunday, going to the synagogue, whatever. Okay. But people <laughs> think that just by going there that any darkness or anything that they did that was displeasing to God in the course of the given week, it didn't matter as long as they showed up for services on the weekend. Right? So, uh, God insisted that their behavior needed to change. He would allow you to live in this place if, in fact, you were being obedient. The people's situation was not hopeless, but they needed to repent and submit themselves to God's command once again, and Michael, you used the word earlier. If you repent, then you do what? You make? Starts with a T. Teshuvah. Teshuvah. Mm -hmm. All right, I was muted. Teshuvah, yes. <laughs> Teshuvah. Teshuvah. Teshuvah is the Hebrew word to repent, to turn away and walk toward God. 180 degree turnaround. Oh. Not 360. 180. Okay. All right. So, uh, verses four and five, Sheila. Verses four and five. Okay. Do not trust in deceptive words and say, the temple of Adonai, the temple of Adonai, the temple of Adonai. No, if you truly mend your ways and your deeds, if you are doing justice between a man and his neighbor, not okay. oppressing. What, does it? Yes, it. Okay, so the temple of Adonai, the temple of Adonai, the temple of Adonai. Yeah. What, what does God do when he's trying to make a point? Repeats. Repeats. Do not trust deceitful words. Could also be rendered stop trusting in deceitful words. The original Hebrew implies that the people were already trusting falsehoods. And the prophet insisted it stop the people's repetitive chant about the temple of the Lord was technically correct. King Solomon had built a temple and God had chosen it as his dwelling place, but Jeremiah would explain how their words were deceitful words. The temple of the Lord, the temple, you know, it's like saying it's, it's tantamount to showing up on Sunday and and live without that the rest of the week. Jeremiah said that if the people would really transform their ways and actions, God would respond. I'm thinking of, again, that there are certain churches that require you that when you pray, that you have to go through certain 
beads. Mm -hmm. Certain ritualistic kind of prayer repetition. Mm -hmm. Okay. Temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Catch the drift. Okay. They also had to act justly toward one another. What a novel idea. Act justly toward one another. Yahafta mm Laresha -hmm. Kamocha. What does that mean? Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Okay. That commandment is equal to what? The first five commandments all roll into one. Yeah, equal to the first. Yeah. Okay. It says after we say the Shema, okay, hear, O Israel, the Lord their God is one. We say, uh, 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 that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength. And these words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart, and you will teach them diligently to your children. Amen. Mm -hmm. So token lip service would not do. They also had to act justly toward one another. True justice came when people determined to treat one another as God prescribed in a day when people were concerned only about themselves. Jeremiah called them to reflect on God's desire for his people. Okay, some people take, think that God is a punitive God and that, uh, you know, that they'll come into a relationship with him when they're ready to die. <laughs> when are you going to be ready to die? You don't know. You don't know. Exactly. And when I first came to the Lord, I can't help but always reflect on what this person said to me. He said, you could step outside tomorrow and get hit by a beer truck. <laughs> it was rather explicit. Okay, a big, heavy-duty truck. Okay. Bud um, heavy. What? Bud heavy. <laughs> Bud <laughs> heavy. Yeah. Okay. But, um, you don't know. You don't know if you have tomorrow mm -hmm. at all. Right. So you're going to sit around and wait and say, Okay, I'm going to die on Tuesday. Maybe then I'll come to the Lord. Okay. Let's read six and seven, Sheila. Not opposing the sojourner, orphan, orphan and widow, nor shedding innocent blood in this place, nor going after other gods to your own ruin, then I will let you dwell in this place, in the land that I gave your fathers forever and ever. God consequently demonstrates concern for the outcasts of society. Remember what we said was the theme in the very beginning? What do we say? It was the key doctrine here. Exodus 22, 21. Mm. 21 and 22, actually. Set apart. You must not. Exodus 22, 21. And 22. You must not mistreat any widow or orphan. Go on. If you mistreat them in any way and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry. My wrath will burn hot and I will kill you with the sword. Wow. Okay. So, and we also said that in, uh, in James, Okay, one, one, what was it, 123? Okay, he said, pure and undefiled religion before our God and Father is this, to care for the orphans and the widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Whoa. Remember that, please. To keep oneself unstained by the world. That's a mouthful. Okay, because we got a lot of people with one foot in the world and one foot in church. In church in heaven. Okay, so uh, again, the law also commanded fair treatment for those who had no father to represent them, to provide for them. Widows were also facing justice uh, from people in power. 
Isaiah, Isaiah, who prophesied a century before Jeremiah, chastised God's people for the same sins. Jump with me back to Isaiah 117. 117. Isaiah 1, you said? Yes, seven, verse 17. Learn to do good, seek justice, relieve the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. All right, jump ahead to uh, 23, Lystra. 23. Your princes are rebellious and friends with thieves. Everyone loves a bribe and chases off to rewards. They do not defend the orphan, nor does a widow, nor does a widow's case come to them. Okay. Uh, Shall I go on? Therefore, says the Lord Adonai, Shabbat, the, the might, no? So, okay, we're good. His next stipulation was no longer shed innocent blood. Keep in mind, that all of this time, again, I keep saying this over and over again, all of this law, albeit better called not law, but instruction. Okay, this is a book of instruction. This is a love letter from God to us, to these people and uh, these humanoids who had never heard of these concepts before. Okay, and if you look around, there are a lot of, we're surrounded by still by a lot of these people who have never been taught anything about the word of God. I mean, what goes through the mind of another human being that can arbitrarily just drive in and shoot a bunch of people in a crowd? It happens every day here, mm. every day. Somebody just decides I've got a gun and I might as well use it, okay? Um, and I'm just gonna, it just doesn't have any impact on their being that they're ending somebody else's life. It just staggers me. Hmm. Okay, um, the first commandment told Israel to worship God alone. Okay, jump with me, please, is, uh, to Deuteronomy 6. Verses 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. <clears throat> Continue. Yes, ma'am. Love Adonai your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your strength. These words which I command, which I am commanding you today are to be on your heart. You are to teach them diligently to your children and speak to them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. Bind them as a sign to your hand they are to be as frontlets between your eyes and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Essentially, you don't need anything else. You have that underlined in your Bible? Yeah. You have it highlighted in your highlighted, Bible? Highlighted, not underlined, highlighted. It is the central part of the entire word of God, which is why we stand up in the synagogue and we turn east toward Jerusalem and we recite those very words. Okay. We are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. And these words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart, and you will teach them diligently to your children. children. And you will bind it as a sign upon your hand and wear it upon your heart. What what is it referring to there when it's talking about binding it? Okay, we have these this is 
when you have, we talked about this before, having a mezuzah on the doorpost of your house. Mm -hmm. okay. There's a scroll inside the mezuzah. Mm -hmm. It says, what, well, Mr. Yes, just yes. yes. <clears throat> what else are we refer to when it says bind it as a sign upon your hand and is upon your heart, upon your arm? Is it the yamaka? No. No? That you should is, in your brain? You know, yamaka, yamaka is Yiddish. Whereas okay. Kippa is Hebrew, just so you know. Okay. Yeah. Oh no, it's not the not the kippa. Okay. Is it that it must always be in our thoughts and our minds at all times? So what is it that the that many religious then do to to do that? They put something with like a little my like a little microscope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the third eye. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they, they do put something, but it's not like a microphone. It's well, not put something in, in front there, no? Yes. Like a little leather box. <laughs> it's a leather box, box. okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it's called, anybody know, $64,000 and a brand new Cadillac. Oh, boy. Tractor free. Collector. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Uh, oh called, yes okay all right yeah <laughs> it's also called it's also called to fill in to fill in that's right that's and right. what's what is inside of there same thing these laws the okay. scroll scrolls uh, Deuteronomy, what that. what she just read mm -hmm. okay. so again in the box it's here and it's affixed and yeshua wore one when he prayed Okay, there's a box that's affixed to the head, a leather box, and in it is that scroll, three of them. Okay, three of them are in that by a little tiny scroll, mm. all written out in Hebrew, okay? And there's, there's a leather strap that goes all the way down around the head and all the way down the arm and around to the finger. Yeah. Okay, wow. and on the arm is another box. Mm. And there is one scroll there. Okay, same scroll. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 11, through 11, through 9, excuse me. Okay, and um, so uh, it, do you think it's important? <laughs> okay. Yes, it's, well, it's they important, were, but they, I never heard of that. Oh, yeah. Well, but, <laughs> do people still do that? Oh yeah, they're the Cedics in Brooklyn. They walk around with that all the time. Especially when before you're about to pray. Yep, they walk around with that all the time. Well, on, them. When you put it on, it's called the laying on of tefillin. Oh. Okay. And people and, and men do that all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, again, the reason why we stand up during the liturgy and face Jerusalem is because we know that uh, the Lord's coming back and placing his feet firmly in as Niag Niagara Falls. <laughs> That's what I heard a preacher say. Niagara Falls. Anyway, but he's placing his firmly feet firmly where? In Jerusalem. In Jerusalem. In Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Okay, so God delivered his people from centuries of slavery in Egypt. He had led them to the land he had promised to, to Abraham. Um, nevertheless, God's promise required obedience. Obedience and disaster would come if the people turned away from him. Verse 8, please. Okay, where are we? 7-8. Okay, look, you are trusting in deceptive words that are empty. Okay, so Jeremiah challenged uh, uh, his challenge about trusting deceitful words echoed his earlier warning. Indeed, the people were worshiping in the temple, but their worship full words as they approached the temple simply did not meet their actions away from the temple. Okay, isn't that not exactly what we were just talking about? Okay. I'm going to go out and I'm going to do this and this and this and this. And it's, uh, it doesn't even phase me 
that it would be displeasing to God. Because on Sunday, I'm going to go to church and everything's going to be hunky-dory. That's right. Amen. So mm -hmm. we should not serve others because we expect something in return. Yeshua urged his followers to serve without expectation of reward or reciprocation. How is the treatment of others, especially orphans and widows, a barometer of true worship, or of, worship of God? Think about what we just said, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Okay, how is that a barometer? Treating others, especially orphans and widows, a barometer of true worship of God. Treat others as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, that's why he said that that commandment is as equal as Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Okay, you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Okay, love your neighbor, because if you love your neighbor, you're doing God's work. Amen. Okay. Amen. Any other thoughts on that subject? How does the treatment of others, especially orphans and widows, a barometer of true worship? It just seems in line with if you love what he loves, then you'll love as he loves. Ooh, interesting. Say that again, please. If you love who he loves, then it shows you love him. Otherwise called obedience. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Verse nine, Sheila. Verse nine. Here we are. Will you steal, murder, and commit adultery and perjury and offer incense to Baal and walk after other gods whom you have not known and then come and stand? Okay. Oh, Oops. Okay. Verse nine. Okay. Um, I do appreciate your enthusiasm. That's how I thought. <laughs> Uh, Jeremiah continued to condemn the people's sin. The words translated steal, <laughs> murder, trans, uh, uh, murder, adultery, swear falsely are the same words that appear in the Ten Commandments. Apparently, these practices were rampant in Judah. Mm. Thoughts? What were we just talking about? Obedience. Steal, murder, adultery, swear falsely, were rampant in Judah. Then, and now, hmm. are, the, are we not surrounded by these things? We have something called newspapers. We have television news, okay? News outlets that make all of, that, that thrive on letting us know about all this negativity. Okay? And they have sponsors that come on and say, buy this, this, and this. And so we'll tell you about who killed who. Okay? I mean, when you put it in perspective, to burn incense to Baal and worshiping Canaanite fertility deity, the book of Judges recounts how God's people often bowed down to Baal. Then, under Israel's wicked rulers, King Ahab and uh, his lovely bride Jezebel. Remember them? Yep. Ahab and Jezebel. Sweet, wonderful people. Okay. <laughs> Baal worship in the northern kingdom reached its apex during those days. God sent Elijah to demonstrate God's power over Baal. Baal. Okay. Jeremiah's words were regarding gods that you have not known further stress their lack of allegiance to the Lord. Verse 10, Sheila. And then come and stand before me in this house that bears my name, saying, we are saved, so that you may keep doing all these abominations. Okay. So what's another word for saved in Hebrew? Yeshua. Shua. Oh. Salvation. The word Yeshua is salvation. Mm -hmm. All over scripture. God mm -hmm. expressed frustration with his people that they would stand before me in this house 
they rightly were worshiping at the place he had chosen to, and put his name on it. Nevertheless, he knew the corruption that filled their hearts and how they lived away from the temple. The translators uh, differ on how they render the words, we are rescued. Other translations don't say saved, they say rescued. Okay, but if you're saved, you are rescued. Amen. Amen. But we can continue dwelling or just continue doing all of these detestable acts. Again, I'm saved. I can do anything I want to do because in the end, I'm going to heaven. Mm -hmm. Not if you're walking in darkness. Not Amen. if you're walking in darkness. Kalita, you see, you were about to say something. Yeah, a, sort of a silly analogy, but I'm getting a, a picture of it. The movie The Mummy, there's a, a, a skinny guy that plays both sides of the fence the whole time. And around his neck, he's got like every spiritual symbol. And he basically said, you know, I'm just I'm just trying to cover all the bases. And, and, <laughs> and that's just kind of like this. It's like, let me just play at every sandbox and then I'll be okay. And God's like, no, no, no. I want you in my sandbox. <laughs> All these others. Yeah, I keep thinking of astronauts who, you know, leave the bounds of Earth. Okay, but around their necks, they, you know, they might have a, a Mogan David, a Jewish star, or or a cross, or whomever, you know, thinking that they're under protection. Uh, you know, I don't, I'm not judging their relationship with God, but you know, that's certainly the case. I'm also thinking about the conversation I heard once in an interview. There's an astronaut and they're getting ready. They're doing a countdown. And somebody, the, the controller is saying, you know, what's the first thing that you're thinking about right now? And he said, I'm thinking about the fact that this job went to the lowest bidder. No. <laughs> <That was> good. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> believers have to confront their sin instead of excusing it. The Apostle Paul wrote that living under God's grace does not mean that we have to license to live however we please. Rather, grace frees us from slavery to sin so that we can know the freedom of following his commands. That pretty well shuts it down. Okay? Grace frees us from slavery to sin so that we can know the freedom of following his commands. Where are some of the ways, what are some of the ways that people might try to justify his or her continued sin? The first phrase is everybody else is doing it. And ah. mm -hmm. People also say, well, God died for my sin. Hmm. And I've heard people say that. They say he died for my sins. So I'm forgiven and they don't, but they don't necessarily, they just keep sinning and they don't, okay. they just take it. I've heard a lot of people say, they just say, um, well, I'm forgiven because Jesus came and died for my sins. And I'm like, yeah, but there's more to it than that. You're not living the life that you're supposed to be living. You're still sinning and they don't understand that. What, what they is say, how can a loving God Send me to the to, to um hell. No way. He loves right. me much. He, there's no way he's yeah. going to do that. God is love. If you love me, you want the best for me. You're not going to do that. So uh, you're going to forgive me. Oh, I don't have to be bothered. Some people may say sometimes too, the thief on the cross was forgiven. Yes, so and live and get forgiveness. Yes, yes. At the last minute, mm -hmm. he I never heard read that. a word. He didn't know anything about the Bible, but you know, but it's a matter of the heart. God isn't looking at all yes, of that. Exactly. Yes, it's a heart. Exactly. Thank you. That is a matter of the heart, and God knows your heart. And people, you know, stress uh, over uh, like, and I know our dear sister here just lost her brother last night. Um. And uh, she's always been contorting over the fact that uh, he did or did not have a relationship with the Lord. We don't know. But we don't know until that's his right. last dying breath. We don't know. We don't know. That's right. And God knows his heart. 
Okay, and uh, so Sheila, in her own walk with the Lord, was a testimony to him. She was. Amen. Okay. Amen. So I always uh, remember. Sorry, when they say God knows it, I always remember King David. Yeah, mm -hmm. a man after God's own heart. And what did he do? He no was. Oh my gosh! <laughs> so much things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he was a murderer. He was an adulterer first. He was a murderer. He was, oh, he, forget it. But he repented. He repented. Yes. He repented. And therein yes. lies the key. Okay. He repented. Okay. We that know that he pray a high price for his sin. There are yes. consequences. Yes, he did. Yes. Okay. Yes, he did. Uh, mm -hmm. Through his own children. Mm -hmm. Okay. Verse 12. Verse 12. I gotta get better glasses. <laughs> okay, indeed, go now to my place that was in Shiloh, where I first made my name dwell. Now see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. And because of the wickedness of the people of Shiloh, what happened to Shiloh? Right. You can't find it. Okay, archeologists have found it actually uh, under another city. Okay, but it what was it was completely decimated because of the fact that they were not obedient. Verse 13. Okay, 13. While you were doing all these things, declares Adonai, I spoke to you early and often, but you did not listen. And I called you, but you did not answer. Okay. Did not answer. Okay, sounds familiar because you have done all these things. God repeatedly spoken, but the people would not listen, wouldn't answer his call. Okay, verse 14. Therefore, I will do to the house that bears my name, the one in which you trust, the one that I gave to you and to your fathers, as I have done to Shiloh. Okay, so they turned in the temple and believed God would bless them, regardless of how they lived. Mm -hmm. They trusted their priests to provide the right sacrifices and in King David's descendants sitting on the throne nearby but God wanted more than lip service he wanted their hearts and lives through followers of God embrace his commands amen amen and lastly verse 15 and I will cast you out of my sight just as I cast out all your brother all the offsprings of Ephraim okay bottom line God further warned that he would banish his people from his presence. Okay, throughout the whole wilderness experience, he threatened to do that. But Messiah, Messiah Moses okay, intervened in, in many cases and said, please, Lord, you can't do that. You can't abandon us here. If, if you abandon us, okay, what will the rest of the world say? But God's word makes it clear that we should gather regularly with other believers. But he also wants us to worship him with our lives the rest of the week. Paul challenged the Romans to offer their bodies as living sacrifices to God. People who attend church but live their own way the rest of the week fall short of God's righteous expectations and the deal is that true worship is reflected in our commitment to godly living how does examining god god how does examining how god dealt with disobedience in the past help us to understand how he deals with disobedience now Well, he's given us fair warning. Yeah. Say again. He's, he's given us fair warning. But so wants... Can you look around and can you see any examples of that? You mean of his judgment? Yeah. I mean, yeah. he destroyed other cities. Um, if uh, I guess what comes to mind is that a a sparrow doesn't fall from the sky without him knowing about it. True. Okay, so 
Can you think of things that possibly might be things that we should look at even now that are judgmental on the part of the Lord? I keep thinking about the coldness of hearts that I just never thought would happen, but there's a, um, a, a lack of his kindness. Just like you said, for those who aren't obeying him, it's not in them to be compassionate or to be kind. And watching that grow in these days is, is a little frightening, but it's a reality. Uh, I'm thinking, you know, sometimes we see these uh, horrific weather catastrophes. And sometimes they repeatedly hit the same area over and over and over again. You think he doesn't know exactly what's going on there? There are people living in that area. Again, I'm also thinking of the fact that you know, on the way to uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham asked him, said, if there are 50 people living there, would you still wipe them out that are obedient, that are believers? Okay, and he said, he said, yeah, he said, if there are 50 people or, or 30 people or 10 people or five people, okay, he said he wouldn't destroy it if that were the case. And, and what happened? He destroyed it. Right. He destroyed it because they weren't, the people were not there. Okay. Um, so th the bottom line is, I think, personally, like we talked about earlier, Matthew 24, none of these things happen by accident. Okay. He knows, he knows about the weather. Exactly what he's doing. He destroys certain people and destroys, and these horrific earthquakes happen in this place and the other place. You think he's trying to send us a message? Yes. It's just like in it's just like before, like with the plagues years ago. Yep. Well, did we just not endure a plague? Yes, we did. Okay. Uh I mean, it just is happening over and over and over again. So I can't I can't dismiss this as the fact that the Lord knows exactly what he's doing, where he's doing it. He's trying to send a message. Amen. Amen. Any questions? And, and yes, sir, I be, yes, I understand that. And that's why when I'm, I'm looking at um, Deuteronomy 6 yes. very deeply, it's like, it's like a guide right there. It is a guide. It is a guide. Hear, o Israel. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echa. Right. Hear, right. O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord, God, the Lord is one. Right. Okay, but that word had, Carleen, mm -hmm. okay, it means one. Yes, the Lord is one God. And, right. and my Jewish brethren will say, you know, there is only one God. Right. But one, mm -hmm. that word had, is one made up of multiple parts. It's like in Genesis 1? Like in Genesis 1. Okay, mm -hmm. Elohim is a multiple God. Mm -hmm. Okay, Father, Son. Mm -hmm. Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's why it's so critical to do our thinking. And again, people will argue that point who are not reading the entire Word of God. Mm -hmm. But Elohim, in the beginning, God, in the beginning, Elohim created. Mm -hmm. Okay, it is, it is mm -hmm. a God made up of multiple parts. Okay, and all of that has to be considered. You're right. Yes. Okay, and then it goes on to say, and you will love the Lord your God, right? And, the, and also he emphasized that you teach a scripture to your children. Amen. That mean it extend everything that he's saying. So if your generation pass away, then the other generation shall do it. So yeah. See us right here. <laughs> of the risen